Uh, David Moore, if you'd be willing to lead us in an opening prayer, that would be great. Thank you. Certainly. Dear Heavenly Father, we lift this day up to you and we thank you in your son's name that uh, we are as blessed as we are in these times that we're saved. And thank you for blessing us with uh, our salvation. The fact that we'll get to spend the rest of eternity with you, Lord, not because of what we did, but because of what you did. And, and uh, we pray that this class will really show us how committed the apostles were. And uh, we really pray that the book of Acts will uh, show us how we should be in our communities and everywhere we go. Um, um, lights shining in the darkness. And, and uh, we pray that some of that fervor will rub off on us and and uh, we thank you for everyone here and we beg and plead in your name lord jesus amen amen thank you david very much appreciate that all right let me thank you yeah let me share my screen here so you guys can see that all right see here all right um uh, this is week two obviously of our study of paul in acts and uh last week we viewed him as the persecutor which he was he was persecuting christians and now uh this week's title uh from the booklet is is the convert and so we're going to see uh the change that takes place in him and in in the introduction in the uh booklets uh, Chad Ramsey, who wrote these, he goes through uh, several different verses, and we'll look at not all of them, but most of them, concerning this idea of being converted or turned, um, being changed, and he he kind of equates them all with being transformed, which is which is true. And one of the first ones he mentions is a quote of Jesus from Matthew 18, and calling to him a child, uh, he put him in the midst of them. And said, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And of, of course, our Lord, he, he comes on the scene and he really kind of turns everything kind of upside down in a sense, uh, makes everything different. You know, the, the, the conception is that, you know, you need to be all mature and kind of prideful and haughty and and he brings a child in and says you got to be like this child you have to have faith like a child you have to humble yourself like this child and he he constantly was making things different than people thought uh they should you know they should be and and in the booklet you'll see that he he uses three different versions uh from that for that matthew 18 passage uh one that says turn one that says change one that says convert and, and equates all those with the idea of transformation. He quotes Vines, um, a turning from and a turning to. And I think we see this, we're going to see this tonight, well, throughout the quarter, really, but we're going to see this in Saul, his conversion to being Paul, <laughs> and, uh, and how he really did turn from persecuting Christians, turning to Jesus Christ. And that's what repentance is all about. And sometimes people, people forget about the, the turning to part of repentance. Uh, not that we would ever forget that we need to turn to Christ and we need to move in his direction at all times. But the fact that when we repent, it's not just turning away from the sins and not just confessing the sins, but it's a turning to a, a new way of life. It is a, a true uh, transformation. And in Christ, of course, one of the cool things is that we are transformed, as is described in Romans 6, uh, being slaves to righteousness, to being free in Christ. In Romans 6, it says slaves of, right, slaves of sin to slaves of righteousness. And we are transformed into a place where we 
have freedom. We have the truth brings freedom. Uh, the transformation in Christ brings freedom. And uh, the, the shackles, uh, the chains uh, fall away from us. And we are no longer bound uh, by sin and the results of sin and all the things that uh, go along uh, with that. He, he, he mentioned some other uh, passages uh, in there as well. And uh, one being Acts 15, uh, 3 and 4. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both uh, Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles. So this idea of conversion, turning, changing, transforming, um, and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. And so again, another point where we have the word conversion, uh, this idea, again, of the, of the transformation that we should have. Um, and then uh, in the introduction, it turns to Saul's transformation. Uh, Saul, and again, with his name change, it's really easy to, to see the transformation in Saul to Paul. But uh, again, it switches gears to his particularly. And uh, the booklet quotes Galatians 1.13, for you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And so in Saul, in Paul, we see, a, we see the, one of the greatest examples of transformation, that's for sure. One of the greatest examples of conversion, because he truly changed from this one way of life, this one direction, to a totally different direction, a totally different way of, of being. And he changed his life goals. He changed his life vision. I mean, all these things were transformed. He talks about that in Acts 26. Uh, therefore, okay, and I really, by the way, this is a side note. I, um, I did read through the other accounts uh, this past week, Acts 22, Acts 26. And and, and I love the way the booklet, uh, the way Chad Ramsey brings in those other conversion stories. So as, and we're going to see several of those this evening. And they're just, they're, as, as Paul gives his testimony uh, later about his conversion, I mean, it, it's beautiful. I mean, it's just absolutely beautiful the way he describes what happens. Um, uh, here in Acts 26, he says, therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God. The, the very thing Saul was able to do, uh, he was calling them to do, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. So, He's, he's giving his testimony. He's telling Agrippa, in this case, what's going on. And, and, and he lived this, which I think made his testimony so strong for the people who were willing to listen to Paul and convert themselves. Because he had truly uh, transformed his life, and so he could call other people to transform uh, their lives. Um, and then finishing up that uh, passage today, to this day, I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets of Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. And uh, uh, David mentioned light in his prayer. And, uh, and we're going to see, we're going to see some light <laughs> today. And of course, that was how, Saul, on the road to Damascus, uh, first was confronted with Christ uh, by, the, by, the, by the light. Um, so, um, got a note here in the chat. Clay, did uh, deeds of repentance include baptism? Uh, we're going to see that this calling upon the name of the Lord sure did. That the idea of, well, in the initial repentance, of course, Ron, I would say yes. Uh, it, in our initial conversion, um, we, it's, Greg likes to describe it as a, as a ball or a, uh, just, 
or if he uses the coin idea, the, the back and the front of the same coin, the, the idea of faith and, and all those things that go with faith, the confession of Christ, repentance, baptism, all those things are part of that initial conversion um, experience. And we're going to see that with, as you know, of course, we're going to see that with, um, with Saul. Uh, we're going to see, um, I think it is, in, it's either in the Acts 26 or the Acts 22 uh, account of his conversion, uh, where uh, Ananias says that, uh, you know, be baptized, and that's when his sins will be forgiven. Uh, Bill Moore likes to, uh, as many, he's probably asked every one of you, who was converted on the road to Damascus? And of course, it's no one, because Paul wasn't converted yet. He was, he was confronted he was brought to his knees. He was, uh, he received truth at that point. And then he prays for three days, but the prayers don't save him either. It's, it's when he's baptized that, that his uh, sins are washed away. So anyway, hopefully that was at least a start uh, to answer that question, Ron. And uh, again, Ron or anyone, you're, you're welcome to unmute and just, just ask questions. That's fine. But the, the chat is great, too. I, I, I've got a big enough screen. I can see everything. So that works out perfectly as well. So, um, so Paul, and I liked this quote out of the booklet, he, transform, he transformed from a persecutor to a convert. And we're going to see later, he was the persecuted and then God lets him know through Ananias, or God tells Ananias, he's going to be persecuted. And of course, Paul received a ton of persecution for being a Christian. And so what a, what a transformation for him. Um, and then I just, I saw this uh, picture in my old files and, uh, and thought this was good for us to realize that there is the initial moment, of course, when we are converted, when we are transformed in the waters of baptism, when we are changed. And, and it's, it's a 100% change at that moment in the sense of going from unsaved to saved, uh, going from no spirit to the spirit. And just on and on we could go with the transformation that happens there, not being in the church and then being in the church. And, um, but the Bible also describes the Christian walk as one of growth and one of sanctification, one of becoming more and more and more like Christ. And so I like this picture because it reminds us of that. Uh, Chris or Susan, go ahead. Ah, uh, yes, just quick question. Yeah. So um, thinking about like baptism, you know, you're, you're getting your sins washed away and you're getting converted is part of um, that final piece, the seal of the Holy Spirit? In other words, I'm wondering, is there a way to be baptized but not receive the seal? And if not, then wouldn't the full conversion be based on when the seal happened? Yeah, I, I think that's all one and part of the same process. So, so when we're baptized into Christ, um, we're, we're told that um, it's for the forgiveness of sins. We're told that we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that is the seal that you're talking about, the seal of salvation um, that we see in Ephesians. And, um, and I don't think the word seal is used in First and Second Corinthians, but, um, but, the, no, but, those letters, but, yeah, but those letters talk about how we become the temple, and it's because we've received the Spirit. So we are now the temple of the living God. Um, and so, um, so yes, I, the, the answer to your question, well, the, the answer to your second question is yes. The first question, can someone be baptized and not be sealed? And I would, it, it wouldn't be real baptism then, is what I would say. Um, so the answer to that okay. would be no, in my opinion. I, all right. Yeah. And I appreciate you just um, confirming that because my head was going there. Because I think yeah. about a lot of, I mean, a lot, 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 anywhere that Holy Spirit part, and this is something that sort of got near and dear to my heart, the Holy Spirit part that is part of after, you know, getting cleansed and you have to, you know, get that seal of, you know, so that you're sealing in that, you know, that cleansed state is, um, is that it's the helper. And I think, 
I think for me at times I would miss that because without the helper, the things that God um, is asking us to get, like to have the mind like Christ, right? We would be sure. unable to do on our own. Yet I can see myself at times and others struggle not remembering that part of that um, state of salvation is having the helper. It's extremely yeah. intimidating to folks when that Holy Spirit part and helper is not included in the full thought because they're thinking they've got to do it all on their own. It's, it's sort of like a side mention. And, and I see myself and others trying to be like, oh, I've got to fix this. And really it's getting out of the, the Holy Spirit's way, right? It's not grieving or quenching it so that it can do its role. Yeah, yeah, that's the, the, those are all fabulous comments. I agree. I was uh, one other thing I would add to that is that a lot of times at conversion. Well, let me just tell you now. I've been a Christian a lot of years. I still don't understand. I, I would never claim I know truths about the Holy Spirit, and I know truths that the Bible reveals to us about how He works, and you know. But I would never claim to have like a full knowledge of of how the Spirit works. And, and when I was baptized, I sure didn't really have, you know, hardly any knowledge. I mean, I was just, you know, and that, that's part of the growth that we have in Christ. It was really great. It was, it was 10 years after my baptism before I really was given a, a, a great teaching uh, uh, concerning uh, the Spirit. And then, then, of course, in college, too, as I, you know, went, continued on with the uh, Bible study. but. Uh, but yeah, yeah, we, we, and so that's the testimony also to what you're saying, Susan, about how we, um, you know, we, we can't do it on our own, you know, and, 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 um, and I think that is important. I think that's part of the, um, uh, the, the humbling ourselves in the sight of the Lord and just, just realizing, you know, and, and we all, everyone in here, we all know we need Christ, but just to, to live a life where we recognize that need, you know, more fully. Uh, as we grow in Christ, but those are the, the seal. Also, that that concept of the seal. Um, if you can picture an old envelope, maybe from uh, from the time of Christ, maybe they would put wax on it, and mm -hmm. then they would, they would put that seal. They'd have a ring, a signet ring, and they would seal that. And um, and and to to show the authenticity, and to show the reality of of um, who's behind this. And that's, you know, God gives us this gift. And it, uh, he's also called a, uh, a guarantor or a, or a down payment, a, a surety of our salvation, um, along with that idea of seal. That this is God telling us, and again, like he needed to. I mean, he didn't have to prove to us he was going to save us. But he wanted to show us, hey, you know what? I'm going to give you a down payment. I'm going to give you a little bit of, you know, to show that you have salvation. I mean, it's just unbelievable. He gives Christ, and then Christ said, well, I've got to go back to the Father so He, so we can send the Spirit. And um, and then, you know, just over and above, you know, the the, yeah, the, the fullness that God brings our way is, is definitely amazing. Uh, oh. David, David, go ahead. Yeah. Man, I just loved uh, her comments. I really did. Um, and uh, I really... I really believe too that a big job of the Holy Spirit is when we open God's word, it's not like opening any other book. The, the, the Holy Spirit literally shows us how he wants a certain passage to apply to our lives even at that moment and it's interesting that uh, god's word is so living and so active that i feel like um god through the holy spirit has shown me the same passage in different lights depending upon what i've gone what, what, what i'm going through at that moment so one passage can get me through one circumstance, but then that same passage can get you in a, through through another circumstance, yeah. and you know, you know, so that just, uh, I mean, the link up, I guess you could call it a link up between God's word 
the Holy Spirit, the Father and Son, just all working together is just um, so amazing. And it's really hard to describe that to people um, who haven't um, accepted the message of salvation yet. Well, right, and they can't really because they haven't received salvation. They haven't received the Spirit. They haven't received forgiveness. They're not part of the church. The the, the Word, as you so wonderfully described it, David, uh, the Word doesn't have the power. It still is the power. I mean, it's still the Word. It's still truth. But it, 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 it can't quite have the same oomph that it does with a Christian. Um, there's just no doubt about it. We we definitely gain. Um, I, I'm not gonna. It's not some miraculous, you know, insight where we see things other people can't see. I'm not saying that. I think you all get that. But we, but we definitely have received the ability to 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 know that it's God's word and to know that uh, the, the power it has. Um, if that if that makes sense, hopefully it does. Susan, go ahead. You wanted to. Oh yeah, sorry. Um... I don't know. I, I was just cu curious again. You had mentioned that, like when you when you got um, saved, and then you know about, about ten years later, you sort of got more about the Holy Spirit. I was just curious if you you know if you would be willing to share. In in hindsight, do you feel like when you first when you got baptized that you that that Holy Spirit portion of just really understanding, I guess at a foundational level that it's it's the helper that's the only thing that's going to be able to help you get to where where god is asking you to get to or is do you feel like with yourself and maybe others you've been around that that's something that's more tends to be a hindsight lesson down the road for people to go oh that's why they kept mentioning the holy spirit <laughs> well let me let me just word it this way i don't know exactly i think it's both by the way i would i would say it's both of those things but I, so I believe when I was baptized into Christ, all the things that God promises that are going to happen, happen. So I believe that when I was baptized into Christ, I received the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, no doubt about it. I don't have any question about that. You know, no, no, you know, no question about that at all. Um, and I think, you know, I really, I really firmly believe that I would not have been able to get through my teenage years the way I was able to get through them without God's help without. So I'll just, I'll, I'll give that as the example. I think there were temptations thrown before me that I think, again, if I wouldn't have been a Christian um, that, you know, I'm not saying I would have given into them because I don't know, because I was a Christian. I, I did have the spirit and I had uh, the word and, you know, just all the different things going into that. Um, so I believe that it doesn't uh, uh, take my knowledge for God to work in my life, I guess would be the way to put it. And I believe God absolutely worked in my life from the time I was baptized into Christ till now, of course. And, uh, um, and even though I may not have had as good of an understanding when I was baptized as I did 10 years later, thanks to Greg Tidwell, and now, um, way later, <laughs> um, and hopefully 10 or 20 years from now, you know, I'll be stronger in Christ. I sure hope so. I would hate that, that I would, uh, I, I sure have a lot of room to grow. So I hope that that'll keep happening. Uh, Ron, go ahead. Uh, I was just uh, wondering if you thought that on the road to Damascus, when Jesus appeared to Paul, that all that revelation was to show that he was the Son of God, and that there was, and whether there was further revelation of the gospel after his baptism, or everything, did everything occur right there? I, that's a great question, Ron. I think we're um, in one of the accounts. We're told that he went off. Uh, is it Arabia uh, for three years? Yeah. You know, I. Yeah. So I mean, I think he. Now he. We know he knew the the. He knew the scriptures that they had at the time, which was the Old Testament, as far as what we call it. 
I mean, he knew those. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He knew the word. And so I think, I, I think during those three years, so I guess I, I don't think he just automatically had everything given to him, you know, right at that moment. I think, I think, I think he went through a growing process. We know Ananias taught him things. So Ananias taught him things, and then he was baptized uh, into Christ to, to wash his sins away. And then he spent those years, you know, so I, I really think, you know, that might have been his time um, of, of just getting his mind around, like, like looking at Isaiah 53 differently now and realizing, oh, that was this Jesus who appeared to me on the road to Damascus. You know, so I think there was, now he obviously had, you know, they had special gifts of the spirit. They had all sorts of special things and miracles and things going on in the first century that we don't have. And, and he was an apostle. So, you know, there was, there was some added, you know, there should have, there could have been some, you know, actual discussions like God talking to Ananias in a vision. And, you know, there could have been some things that, you know, that we sure don't experience today, but, um, but I, I think it was a growing process, Ron, uh, to, you know, is that kind of how you feel too? Or, well, the only comment I'd make is, if I remember, he preached in Damascus before he went up into Arabia. Yeah, so that's the, yeah, so that's kind of the confuse. well, I'm not going to say confusing, um, but you're right. He did, he did, so Ananias probably was the conduit for some of that truth that he preached in Damascus, and then he took off you know, and then had further development, we might call it. That might have been him getting his master's degree, <laughs> going off to Arabia. Uh, but uh, yeah, he, I mean, we're, we're going to see that today. Um, or anyway, it, in the, in this Acts account, he immediately went to the synagogue, it says, you know, so he, you know, you're right. He was, he was um, getting at least, you know, well, I'm sure it was, you know, the, the full gospel. Um, you know, he wasn't doing some kind of half job, but then I think he was able to develop, I'm sure, in those years of study and contemplation and prayer and uh, become the great, you know, missionary that he ended up being. So anyway, thanks for that. That's, that's a great question and, and good comments there. Um, and uh, okay, and you put that in the chat too. I encourage, yeah, you guys, if you don't have it, and I know if you're on a phone or an iPad or something, it's not as easy as it is with a nice big screen on a computer. But yeah, pull pull up some of that stuff uh, whenever you whenever you want. So okay, well let's. The, I'll tell you the main. And I thank you, Susan. Thank you, uh, Ron, um, um, for these uh, you know comments and, and questions and things. Really, really appreciate that. I think that's really important for us to do. Um, I'm going to um, the. The main, the, the booklet had three sections uh, for today. The first was kind of Ananias' call. Uh, the booklet called it his um, uh, being, um, uh, well, we'll get to it in a second. I can't, I'm not going to, this was last week's text, Acts 9, 1 through 9. Um, if you watch the recording later, you can pause on those if you want to look at it. And then a map here. Just wanted to, again, show where Damascus is, uh, way up to the northeast of the this, this large uh uh, area of Palestine or Israel. Um, and then, so Ananias enlisted. So God confronts, or doesn't confront, God asks Ananias to do this work with Saul. And But the main place today that I want us to look at are verses 13 through, um, I think 13 through 16, the second section of the booklet. Um, I'll read this, of course, about him being enlisted and the last part about uh, Saul being baptized. But that middle part has some of the, um, the some of the meat theologically of, of today's lesson. So um, we'll get to that, and then we can uh, come back to some of the other if we want. But uh, uh, verses ten through twelve. Uh, now there was a disciple of Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here am I, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And by the way, if you look in some study Bibles, Damascus still has a very long east to west straight street. Um, and a lot of people feel that that's probably, um, you know, still the one um, that, that he would have been on. 
uh, with a lot of almost jigsaw kind of roads all around it. So it would make sense that this would be the one still. Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. And so just a word about visions real quick. Uh, there were a lot about visions uh, here in the ver uh, book of Acts, and, uh, and of course, uh, some of the Old Testament as well and, and throughout Scripture. Um, we remember that Peter received a vision so that he knew it was okay to go to Cornelius. We looked at that two quarters ago when we looked at Peter in the book of Acts. And then Jennifer, with her teaching that Philippians class, we were, um, we were talking this week about Philippians and, and the Macedonian call. And of course, Paul has a vision in Acts 16 of a man saying, hey, come over here, we need help, <laughs> a Macedonian. And, uh, and of course, he heeded the call. And we, we sing a song about the Macedonian call. And uh, of course, that's what that's talking about. So and here's that text uh, for that. We're actually going to study this. I think it's uh, July 5th. We'll get to this point uh, where Paul receives the Macedonian uh, call, and he does uh, follow through with that. And then another thing that's in the booklet about Ananias being called by God to go to Saul, um, this is how Saul, or Paul, by the time we get to Acts 22, of course, uh, Paul describes Ananias this way a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there. Uh, this one, this Ananias, this devout man came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour, I received my sight and saw him. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. And uh, Chad in the booklet makes a, a, a big deal, and rightfully so, about calling on his name. And we'll look at a Joel um, a passage in, in just a, where it talks about that and the one Peter quoted in the sermon on the day of Pentecost. Um, and then the booklet had this quote, The Lord used a vision to prepare both Ananias and Saul for their meeting. And if you'll remember, Cornelius had a vision and Peter. So sometimes these two visions working together bring people together and, you know, cause God's will uh, to be done, like in this case. Ananias received a vision. Saul received a vision that Ananias would come and cure him of the blindness. And uh, so pretty, pretty neat. So let's spend most of our time here, uh, verses 13 through 16, a reluctant Ananias and, you know, he, you know, I, I, the, the booklet might have made a little more of him being reluctant than maybe I would have. I just kind of, I'm just impressed with anyone in scripture who has the, the comfort to talk to God, to, to talk in a back and forth kind of way with the almighty God. I'm just always impressed with that. So Ananias saying, oh, you know what though, God, he's he's been killing Christians. He even has letters. He's going to come here and arrest people. You know, I just think to have that kind of faith, I, I view that as a very, um, you know, a very, a very trusting, um, a, a great realization of the reality of God and his willingness to talk. You know, I just, I think that's amazing. I think if, um, I don't know if I'd have the nerve. Um, and again, I don't think it shows a lack of faith. It's just kind of the human, maybe the, the human urge or something like that. But I, I um, you know, I don't view it necessarily as, as some awful thing. Yeah, Susan, go ahead. Question, yeah. So <clears throat> um, God was talking directly to Ananias, correct? Yes, yes. Yes. So I, I think of like, times where I'm like, oh, if God, you would only drop, talk directly to me, like with Jonah or Ananias, right? And, and it's sort of like, why can't you just tell me right out? Because I know that that, that is capabilities there. But then I realize after I have my moment of, would you just tell me, everyone that got talked to in the Bible directly by God had usually some great big thing they had to do. I mean, what one of the prophets had to go and like eat dung and another one had to marry a hooker and 
you know, he's got to go, you know, so, you know, Jonah had to go to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, and go tell him to all, you know, and I think about that, and I'm like, I want God to talk directly to me, so you sort of have that black and white answer, but then I realize that if I get to that level, if I could, if, if I would even get to that level where we, you know, where we could talk freely, and he's talking back to us, so we'd probably feel more comfortable in a way, because we're hearing him, Mm -hmm. The big things he always asked those people. I don't know if he ever talked to someone and they didn't have something big they had to go do. So I was just curious, <laughs> like, be yeah. careful what, like, I wish for, you know, because then I'm like, never mind. I would like a desk job, not necessarily front line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's great. But I mean, I'll, I mean, uh, just two things. Um, God has asked you, Susan, to do great things, and you do sure, great. Sure, but not direct, not not from. His I know, I know. I just I want to make sure that you know we've been we've been given a great call as well. Agreed. Um, agreed. Agreed. But but that is interesting, and and I don't. I mean, we'll just it it seems. I'm just going to say it seems because you know obviously God could talk to any one of us anytime He wants. Right. But it sure seems like He is doing that through His you know, completed word that we have now. So that just, that seems great. to be, the, you know, the way that that is uh, happening now. But that no, well, that's a great question and a great comment. So, and I agree, ahead. I agree with you there. And I think why we see this in Old Testament so much, right? Because it's building out. It's building up, building out the whole thing. There's not a need for him to talk to us directly because everything I think that's been built out is, is here for, for us th this day and age. We have everything we need. And so, for him to talk directly to me wouldn't be adding anything to what I can't already get from scripture. But, but it would, would be sort of nice, like, should I, you know, on the minimal things in life, you know, yeah. not should I pick this dress or that dress, but you know what I mean? Some of those things you think are so big, but, yeah. um, but I think th that's the whole thing. The great thing about the old Testament is it gives us examples in history of when he talked directly to people, there was a really good reason and a big thing that was going to happen. And yeah. so I, I asked myself, would I rather live back then and maybe had a chance to have direct conversation or do I just allow scripture to talk to me and actually be okay? And maybe there'll be a little bit more mystery in my life of decision-making yeah. on things that clearly aren't as pertinent as the things from Old Testament. Right, right. And, and, and I'll just, uh, one more thing I'll add to that is that if you really look at how many different people God did talk directly, it's not very many over those 4,000 right. years of the Old yep, Testament yep. and then, you know, the other uh, 50 to 90 years of the new. So yeah, <laughs> really, even if you would have lived back then, the, the odds might have been pretty slim. <laughs> That's true. true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so let's look at a few things from this, from these, just this little paragraph here. Um, Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he's done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So, uh, so here's, here's what Ananias is given. And let's just look at a few of these, actually four different phrases in this. And, and that'll be the brunt of the lesson today. Um, all who call on your name, um, extremely interesting that already, you know, Ananias, um, uh, Ananias is using that phrase. And of course, it's from the prophet Joel, uh, chapter two, uh, verses uh, 28 to 32. And then Peter on the day of Pentecost quotes that whole, and those four verses, that's a pretty lengthy little um, uh, section to memorize. They're, they're long verses. Um, and this idea of calling upon the name of the Lord is, is the idea of really this idea of conversion, this idea of, okay, now I am putting myself in your hands. I'm putting myself in the hands of the Lord. I'm, I'm calling upon him. And, and nothing in the Bible is, is uh, passive, so to speak. Like when the Bible talks about faith, it needs to be a living faith. It's an active faith. It's not just a, a, a whimsical thought that goes through the mind. And same with love. Love in the Bible is not just a feeling. Love is active. Love, all these things are, are real and active, not passive. And same with 
Calling upon the name of the Lord is not just praying, although that's an act, obviously that's an active thing, but it's, it's more than that. It's a, it's a life behind it. And it's kind of like the idea of God's name in and of itself. God's name is not just the name. It represents all that God is, all that he has done. It, it represents him and his entirety. Um, and so the same is true with faith and love and calling upon him, all these different things. It's, it's an all in uh, kind of thing. I, I just discovered a TV show um, during quarantine uh, called Designated Survivor. It has Kiefer Sutherland in it. Anyway, I've really enjoyed it. Um, there's a point where the press secretary um, covers for his brother. His brother had some uh, like uh, caffeine pills on steroids, illegal um, uh, some, anyway, and the brother covers for him and has to go to, anyway, so he's, he's wondering how his relationship is with the president and the chief of staff says to the press secretary, you're either all in or you're all out. And other, you know, there, there's no being the press secretary and being 99% or 95%. There, there's none of that. You're either all in and, sh and the, the chief of staff wants his answer by the end of the day. And he either needs to be all in or he's gone. And, uh, you know, that's how the Bible is with these things. And it doesn't mean we're sinless. It doesn't mean we're perfect. But we, there's no being half a Christian. Like the, the letter to the church at Laodicea. You know, this, there's none of that. You're, we are in. And we are dedicated. And we are committed. And we are people who call upon the name of the Lord. And that means the whole ball of wax of that that that's talking about if you call upon the name of the lord you are confessing jesus christ you are repenting of your sins you're turning to the lord you if you're if you're already a christian you don't be baptized again but it's part of the conversion problem when you call upon the name of the lord you are baptized into christ you know it's it's the bible's you know all uh not a lot of this uh well not any of this half stuff and that's what god has done for us god went all in in giving Jesus Christ for us. And, uh, and so anyway, that's, that's how that goes. Just a real quick, I thought this was so cool. The outline of Joel chapter two, these are just the ESV study Bible headings. It talks about the day of the Lord, talks about the return of the Lord, the Lord having compassion or responding to his people, the Lord having pity, and then the Lord pouring out his spirit. I mean, that's, we, that's why Peter used this on the day of Pentecost. That's exactly what happened. This is the day of the Lord. He, you know, and we think of the return of the Lord as, of course, Christ coming back the second time. But for Peter, it was the Lord came. The Lord was here. Um, and anyway, just I just think it's really cool. And uh, so I encourage you to read verses 28 to 32. Uh, you've read them uh, uh, before, but I encourage you to do that uh, this evening. The next thing of the four, the Lord uh, said to him, um, you know, the God being active, God responding, uh, just like in Joel chapter two, God having patience is how Chad Ramsey put it in the booklet. Uh, the Lord didn't get all mad at Ananias for his little statement there. The Lord was patient and gave some explanation and said, hey, look, this is what's going to happen. In other words, you don't have to be afraid. Ananias thought, Saul might kill him, probably. But the Lord said, no, 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 no. He's mine. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, they, uh, uh, the, the Lord, uh, the Father, Son, I mean, they got Paul, that's for sure, or Saul, however you want to look at that. Um, and here's the account of that in Acts 26. Um, Paul sees the vision. And actually, we already read verse 19 of this chapter where it says, and I responded to the heavenly vision. Um, Rise, stand on your feet. I've appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a service, a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you. And this was Paul's charge, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So we're already talking about sanctification. We're already talking about those who call upon the name of the Lord. These, these things were pretty full um, once we had the day of Pentecost and the apostles going around teaching um, all these things.
Uh, then the next, the third of the four uh, highlights for these verses, chosen instrument. Um, uh, some of the versions say vessel. Um, he's the one I'm going to use. And uh, just, just a, a couple, number one, just awesome that we are uh, collectively, but I believe God and his foreknowledge, you know, chosen uh, as individuals as well. Uh, no, uh, you know, no predestination in the Calvin way in saying that at all. Um, but also we, we are vessels. God wants to use us. We are instruments of his. And it reminds me of Second Corinthians 4, 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. And in the context, the jars of clay are our bodies. That's us. We're fragile. Uh, but we have salvation. We have the spirit. We have this treasure in us to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Then it talks about how these, these, these fragile clay vessels are being cast around, cast down, but they don't break because of the treasure inside. And that's us. We're, we're whipped around here and there. We face trials um, and uh, we're going to be okay is what it's saying because God is, God is with us. And then finally, I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And, and again, God saying, or the Lord saying, suffer for my name, it, it's totally equivalent with saying, suffer for me, for my sake. Um, the, um, this idea of the name is, is fully representative of the one uh, that it's talking about. And of course, that reminds us of Philippians 3. Paul said that he wanted to know him and the power of his resurrection. And Paul was praying not only that, but that he would also share his suffering, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, um, he says, I might attain or may attain the resurrection uh, from the dead. So, of course, looking to the future, hope that we have in Christ. And then, of course, um, Saul is baptized. So, Ann and I, and we, we already read about that in the other account in Acts 26 and or 22. I, 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 I get them mixed up. But... Um, we, we already looked at that. We're washing away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. Um, here, it simply says in Acts 9, so Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes. He regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days, he was with the disciples at Damascus. So and that ends. The ESV starts a new paragraph with that phrase at the bottom, but it's part of verse 19. So I wanted to stay true uh, to their version and include that there. Um, uh, I, this is in your booklet, this quote. I, I thought it was really good, uh, but I won't read it now. It's, it's, uh, we're right there um, at the end of our time. I thought this was really good. Susan, this, this, you reminded me of this when you were talking. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, uh, but I knew, I knew it was in the booklet and then we'd look at it. But we never know what amazing, awesome, great thing. Obviously, anyone coming to Christ is an amazing, great thing. But we, we never know. Ananias, I mean, he never would have dreamt that, that, People in 2020 would be reading about him going to Saul, and he would have never dreamt that this guy, this Saul guy, was going to write half of our New Testament, not literally, but just so many of our letters that we have in the New Testament, be responsible for so many people coming to Jesus Christ over the last 2,000 years. I mean, who would have thought? And so the same with us. We we share the gospel with one person and maybe that one person, they just, they have one of their children is converted and maybe that child or that child's child ends up converting thousands. I mean, who knows, right? I mean, so we, we need to just like, like Chad says here, we need to never discount the importance of reaching a lost soul with the gospel. It is, it's profound, just one soul is profound, but it can even be more profound than that. And uh, so I, I thought that was really cool that that was one of his uh, applications. Um, and uh, we, 
those of you who have been in the first and second Samuel class uh, with me last quarter and, and now first and second Kings, I've just, I've been fascinated with how David uh, with, with his power, with his, you know, with all his abilities that he always was listening. And here's Saul, super strong personality. We would have to imagine super motivated, you know, gung ho for what he believes in. And he is willing to humble himself on that road. And he's willing to listen to Ananias. Uh, the last couple lines there, Saul did not argue with him. Instead, he yielded his will to God's plan. So these great people of faith we see, a lot of what made them great was their willingness to give in, uh, give in to God, give in to the Lord, give in to the word, and just, okay, I like being impatient, but you know what? Uh, God says I need to be patient. I'm going to give in to that. And whatever command, whatever you might look at throughout scripture, I'm going to give in. I'm going to yield my will uh, to the will of God. So I put the, the questions in here. We don't have uh, time, and we didn't last week either. We probably never will have uh, time for those. And then that's last week's final passage. Okay, so next week, the convert preaches. <laughs> so we've had the persecutor, then the convert, and now Paul now uh, is going to start preaching. We'll look at Acts 13. You can see the verses there, 13 through uh, 41. And uh, uh, George Pryor, if you'd be willing to uh, unmute and lead a closing prayer, uh, that would be fabulous. Appreciate it. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together to look into your word and, and to let your word speak to us, particularly to look at the Apostle Paul and to grow by his example, and to realize that uh, one plus God, and you just don't know what's going to happen. And help us to always keep that attitude for us and for others. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.